Hi, everyone. So in spite of the fact that we're all distracted, let's talk about artificial intelligence. <laughs> so today's topic is actually about uh, the language of thought. It's about intentionality, but it's about the problem of intentionality from a particular lens, from the computationalist lens. Last time we were talking about kind of ways to understand computationalism as a kind of machine functionalism that makes minds analogous to computer software. So our mind is to the brain like what software is to a computer. Um, it explains the things that we can do and it explains also, and this is our topic for today, maybe what the structure is of our mind and what sorts of features it has. So for today, I thought that I would give you an overview of what we might call the language of thought hypothesis. So to start us off, uh, it might be important for me to talk about what a symbol is. What is a symbol? The symbols have been talked about in many different contexts by many different people for many different purposes. But at its most basic level, a symbol is a thing that represents or stands for something else. For example, a round yellow token, if you imagine a round yellow token, I don't have one on me, a round yellow token can be used by a gorilla or a human to uh, act as a symbol for a banana. So it stands for a banana. You can teach a gorilla or a human to use the symbol to be used as a way to ask for a banana or to exchange it for a banana, that sort of thing. Uh, so the, the, the token can be a symbol. The ASL gesture made by pointing one index finger and pretending to peel it with your other hand, if I didn't do that incorrectly, um, that can also function as a symbol for a banana, if I did it right. And the English word uh, banana and the Spanish word platano are also symbols for bananas. So each of these objects, whether they be sounds or whether they be written or whether they be actual objects or whether they be gestures like this, right, or this, those are all symbols. So symbols can be anything. The important thing is that they stand for something else. So in philosophy of mind, people sometimes disagree about whether we have mental symbols or mental representations, if you like, that stand in for things and objects in their own right, just like words in a language, just like the word banana can stand for the object, a banana. Um, some people think that we have an equivalent, some sort of object that stands for bananas. Now, perhaps that object is a functionally specified object. Perhaps it's not a literal thing, like a neuron. Maybe it's just something that can be talked about abstractly. But whatever the case might be, people who think we have mental symbols also uh, sometimes talk about what it is that they look like, or more specifically, how they're structured. So there's people who think that they're structured like words in a language, and people who think that they're not structured like words in a language, they have some other properties. Maybe they're structured like pictures or maps or diagrams or something like that. In computer science, uh, many programming languages are written symbolically with characters or programming objects standing in for either more complex and more fundamental computer processes or for display activity on the computer monitor or for actions of the computer user. So there are different Programming languages, and depending on which programming language you're using, are what the symbols are used for. For example, the JavaScript function alert, um, and you can type in alert parentheses, hello, that will make a pop-up text box show up for the user with the text hello. In this case, the function name is familiar to an English speaking programmer and the text to display has the same format as the text that is inputted by the programmer. However, some functions in uh, programming languages use variables or other symbols to stand for things unlike the variables or the functions themselves. For example, in the Scala programming language, and I had to look this up, I'm not a Scala user, parentheses zero slash colon L uh, parentheses underscore plus underscore parentheses sums up all the elements in a list. Now that that little sentence in the Scala programming language means nothing to us who don't actually program in, in Scala, but each of those symbols do stand for 
other bits of the program and uh, or or other objects like numbers or display sort of features on the monitor and things like that. So the point is just that symbols have the feature that they can be absolutely arbitrary. The structure of the symbol and the appearance of the symbol, the nature of the symbol might have nothing to do with what it stands for. In programming languages, sometimes it's useful to have the structure of the symbol match the structure of the thing it's standing for because it makes it easier for humans to use it. Um, there's an argument about this in computer science that I will not get into because I'm not an expert. But basically, when we now talk about mental symbols, if we do have them, there's a similar debate about whether mental symbols are anything like what we represent them to be when we talk about people's psychology. All right, so with that as background, we've talked about what symbols are. Let's talk about the idea of a physical symbol system, which Andy Clark brings up in chapter two of his book, Mindware. So a physical symbol system, Andy Clark tells us, is a physical device that contains a set of interpretable and combinable items, symbols, and a set of processes that can operate on the items. For example, copying, conjoining, creating, and destroying them according to instructions. To, quote, ensure that the symbols have meanings and are not just empty syntactic shells, the device must be located in a wider web of real world items and events, unquote. So the idea is like, you will have a physical symbol system if you have a physical device that contains these symbols and processes that can operate on these symbols to do stuff. Um, to copy the symbols, to add the symbols together, to create the symbols and destroy the symbols. But in order to make sure that that symbol system isn't purely syntactic, isn't just like an abstract set of operations that operate on nothing, just symbols that don't stand for anything, we want to put the symbol system in a kind of physical space. So we put the symbol system in, in a web of real world items and events. So if we program a physical symbol system, it, in order to be physical, it's got to be able to detect things in the environment, for example, or act on its environment in particular ways. Maybe it has a camera, maybe it has wheels or robot legs or something. But basically the idea is the symbol system becomes a physical symbol system when it's embedded in a world. Now, according to Newell and Simon's definition, an, a symbolic expression in the physical symbol system will designate an object if the system can either affect the object itself or behave in ways depending on the object. So in order for my yellow token to stand for a banana, it's got to be the case that I use it in situations where I want to be dealing with the banana, I want to be addressing the issue of the banana, I want to exchange for a banana, but basically I have to be acting in a way that depends on the banana. There's something essential about being a symbol of a banana that this is that this is its relationship, whether or not I'm using a yellow circle token or whether I'm using a word in language like banana. It doesn't matter. The main thing that matters is for that symbol to stand for the object. Usually we think that there's got to be some relationship between the symbol and that object. According to Newell and Simon, a physical symbol system like that possesses all that matters for thought and intelligence. It is sufficient for intelligence on their view. If you were to build something like a physical symbol system, that thing would be intelligent. And on their view, being a physical symbol system is also a necessary condition for general intelligent behavior. So anything that is intelligent on their view is gonna be a physical symbol system. So on their view, I instantiate a physical symbol system. Uh, my pet cat might instantiate a physical symbol system. And also, if we are to call an object like this intelligent, it, it has to be a physical symbol system. It doesn't get to be called intelligent on their view unless it has a physical symbol system. The physical symbol system hypothesis about humans, about human psychology, is that human psychology can be explained in terms of a physical symbol system. And because you can understand physical symbol systems in a kind of software-based, programming-based way, minds are 
like software of the brain in just this sense that they have symbols that they use to perform operations on either other symbols or on the world. This metaphor becomes an actual description of how our minds work and features that our minds have. Physical symbol system inspired artificial intelligence seems to have three commitments. So the idea is like, if this is the right way to model my mind, then you can also build artificially intelligent things using the same scheme. So if you were to do that, you'd have an artificial intelligence. So there are three commitments that seem to be had by a theory like this about artificial intelligence. First of all, use of a symbolic code is a means of storing all of the system's long-term knowledge. So the symbolic code is also its memory store. <laughs> so anything that it does in order to remember it, it puts it in like a log in symbolic form. Think about like an array or something in, in a programming language. You can store things in the array and pull them out later when you need them. And there's something like this that would be equivalent in the physical symbol system for remembering things that it has seen or processed and pulling them back out when it needs them again. Second of all, uh, a physical symbol system inspired artificial intelligence seems to have a depiction of intelligence as the ability to successfully search a symbolic problem space, generating and modeling, or sorry, generating and modifying symbol structures until it reaches a solution. So if I give such a system a problem, it's going to go through its memory bank, which is symbolic, and it's going to use its symbolic operation processes to try to solve whatever problem it's given, depending on how its physical system is instantiated and what it's built to do, right? Because if you're artificially programming something, probably it has a particular set of problems that it is designed to solve. Thirdly, this artificially intelligent system also seems to have its intelligence residing at or close to the level of deliberative thought. So the idea is this is supposed to be uh, a level of abstraction that matches the level of abstraction that we ourselves would use to describe our own thought. So the artificially intelligent being uses a symbolic code. The symbolic code is the thing that it stores its memory in. In order to solve problems, it also uses a symbolic code and it moves through the symbolic problem space. And this problem space, this symbolic code, is an appropriate level of description for describing our own thought processes. Physical symbol systems, according to Clark, also exhibit the virtue of an, quote, ability to easily capture complex structured relationships and to represent part-whole hierarchies. What does that all mean? So I'm going to talk about the language of thought for a moment, because I think talking about the language of thought will put this all into its requisite context. Clark is interested in talking about how you build an artificially intelligent thing. One hypothesis was that if you built a physical symbol system, then you would be building an artificially intelligent thing. What makes us say that it's an artificially intelligent thing beyond just the fact that it can manipulate symbols, which is kind of cool? One compelling hypothesis parallel to the physical symbol systems hypothesis is called the language of thought hypothesis. And in order to explain the language of thought hypothesis, I have to explain Fodor, Jerry Fodor's representational theory of mind. According to this representational theory of mind, propositional attitudes pick out computational relations to internal representations and mental processes are causal processes that involve transitions between internal representation. So what it is to have a belief is to have relationships among certain internal symbols that I have. So this is a quote from Jerry Fodor, to a first approximation to think it's going to rain, so I'll go indoors is to have a tokening, an instantiation if you like, of a mental representation that means all go indoors, caused in a certain way by a tokening of a mental representation that means it's going to rain. <laughs> so I've got these internal representations that stand for it's going to rain and that stand for I'll go indoors. So to think that it's going to rain so I'll go indoors is to instantiate each of those things. So literally there is language-like activity in my mind. There are internal representations in my mind that stand for states of affairs out there. So my mental processes on the language of thought view are 
causal processes that involve transitions between these internal representations. So what it is to have a deliberation is to have a sequence of beliefs and hypotheses and inferences from one belief to another belief and to end up with a belief that is structured in a way that picks out states of affairs in the world that correspond to that belief being true. Does that sound confusing? Let me put it another way. The flat core of the idea is that my mind is coded in a language, just like language itself. So this language that I'm speaking now is the English language. It has certain features. It has sentences that I can form. Sentences are units of meaning. A sentence that I say picks things out in the world. So if I say, here is a book, it stands for a state of affairs in the world, namely the state of affairs in which there's a book here. That sentence, that set of sounds that came out of my mouth picks out something in the world. There is a similar and analogous thing happening inside my brain. There is a mentalese language in monogon that can also represent, here is a book. Now my mentalese is not necessarily the English language. It's a bunch of mental symbols as opposed to being symbols in English. My mind has a mental word <laughs> that stands for the book. So that mental symbol that we talked about with the physical symbol systems is also going to be, according to Fodor's representational theory of mind, something in my mental language. So in my language of thought. So to have beliefs is to have something like mental sentences that I have attitudes about. Why would you ever think that our mind has language-like activity and that our thought can be explained in terms of language? Well, besides one, the intuitive appeal, that's, that that's something of what it feels like to have thoughts. The real attraction of an account like this and the reason it gained traction in the scientific and philosophical community is that we think, we have the intuition that thought might be structured like language. To put this more precisely, language exhibits the feature we call compositionality. Now, compositionality is the feature that the basic elements of language can be recomposed and recombined to make for new meanings because language exhibits semantic structure. So if I have a phrase like, there is a book in front of me, I can rearrange the elements of that phrase or, or add different elements to that phrase to make for different meanings. Like, there is a book in front of me. Oh, there is a book behind me now. Or I can say, I can substitute book for something else. There is a phone in front of me. The compositionality of language allows me to do that sort of operation by changing out each of the symbolic pieces the symbolic parts of the meaningful unit, the sentence. So because language exhibits compositionality, the language of thought hypothesis says that my thoughts also have this compositional structure. The mental symbols that I have for things like phones and things like books can also be put together with other symbols that stand for things like being in front of or being behind of. Put together, I can therefore make new thoughts using the same components that I use for all of my thoughts. So that's compositionality. This compositional feature also explains another feature of language and thought, which we call generativity or productivity, depending on who you ask. And generativity or productivity are the ability of language and thought to produce infinite meaningful propositions by recombining the basic elements. So with the the elements book in front of behind me right i can i can do an infinite number of things with all of the words in a language similarly the thought is with the symbols that i have that are mental symbols if they exist i would be able to put together an infinite number of thoughts because my mental language would be compositional because all that it would take is like pulling out one element and substituting in another this also helps explain another feature of language which is systematicity the fact that if a system can represent something like 
the sentence, Mary loves John, then that system also has the ability to re represent that John loves Mary. So compositionality means that I can, I can substitute elements for each other. Systematicity means that if I can represent things in one direction, so to speak, I can also represent them in the other. So these are important features of language that we think are also features shared by thought. It'd be weird if you thought that somebody could think about Watson being friends with Holmes, but wouldn't be able to think about, wouldn't even be able to form the thought that Holmes is friends with Watson. So the idea that our thought might operate symbolically can explain all of these things. Because if you've got these little units, these little symbols that can be composed into new organizations on the basis of either their own structure or the structure of the system or how the system processes things, then you'll be able to also explain all these other cool features of thoughts. So inherently, the representational theory of mind or the symbolic theory or the language of thought theory has that attraction. All of the things we can do with language are also things that we can do with thought, which might help explain why it is that we human beings seem to be good at using language. It's sort of a unique capacity that we have that not a lot of creatures exhibit, <laughs> the capacity for symbolic thought. So going back to now the physical symbol systems for a moment, the physical symbol systems hypothesis says, well, if we think that minds are symbolic systems and we're able to build symbolic systems or program symbolic systems, then maybe those symbolic systems will exhibit in intelligence if we build them in a similar way to how we build minds. So maybe anything with a symbol system is intelligent. The physical symbol systems hypothesis just says, well, it's intelligent as long as it's embedded in a physical environment that it's responding to where the symbols stand for things. And then the, the symbol system itself is just processing things syntactically if that makes sense. So it's just taking the structure of the symbols in a row or how they're composed and changing it around. It itself isn't straightforwardly directly messing with the meanings of the symbols. The meanings of the symbols are set by the environment that the symbol system is in and then the system itself just deals with the syntax, with the form, with the logical format, if you will. The traditional way to understand computationalism about mentality was as a theory where we are physical symbol systems and furthermore we are what Andy Clark calls semantically transparent systems. That means that we'd be systems whose computational operations are defined over familiar symbolic elements. So they reflect our own ideas about the domain. When we're thinking about those computational symbols I was, I was proposing earlier, the, the function in JavaScript and the function in Scala. The function in JavaScript is semantically transparent. That means that the word that we used for the function transparently refers to an operation that we understand in, in English, right? But you could also have a system that's not semantically transparent. Perhaps, although I don't think it's true, perhaps Scala is a language like that where the functions don't reflect our own ideas about the domain of things that the functions operate over. So the traditional way to understand computationalism about mentality was that our own mental symbol system was semantically transparent. That is to say, maybe our own mental symbols were recognizable to us when we were doing psychology. They were describable at a level where the symbolic elements were familiar. Things like book, as a concept would be represented in the system. That was, that was the traditional way to think about computationalism and representationalism about mentality, that the symbols we were gonna find were gonna be familiar things. Now that's not a popular view so much anymore within computationalism. People have reduced their confidence that our representations, that our mental representations, if they exist, are gonna be things that we can recognize the same way that we can recognize a drawing <laughs> or a picture or a word like phone or a word like book. Andy Clark thinks that computationalism has evolved beyond that view that mental systems are sem semantically transparent. 
there are ways for systems to be uh, physical symbol systems without being semantically transparent, for example, by being structured probabilistic systems. And we won't talk about that today, but I'm just highlighting it as an important aside. It's an important modern feature of computationalism that it doesn't necessarily assume that we have a semantically transparent system in the mind. Okay, so we've been talking about the kind of background understanding of these ideas long enough. Let's talk about one sort of objection that's been launched to the language of thought hypothesis and specifically to machine functionalism. So is this a good description of how our own thought works? And is this a good description of what it takes to be intelligent? In something that has been called the Chinese room thought experiment thought of by philosopher John Searle, a man sits in a room processing written sentences in Chinese characters that come through his mail slot. So you can imagine that there's a person sitting at a desk and he gets pieces of paper through this mail slot and the pieces of paper have Chinese sentences written on them in Chinese characters. Processing these characters requires the man to consult multiple volumes of an instruction ma manual. Um, and these instructions will tell him how to produce new Chinese characters purely on the basis of what the Chinese characters are that he receives. We can imagine that the manual that this person has is thousands of volumes long. And it's not actually instructions for how to, how to, to get him to learn Chinese, it's just instructions for how to take the particular lines and figures that are presented to the man and turn them into, by a series of operations, symbols that he can put back through the mail slide. So suppose that this system is a system that would convince somebody on the other side of the mail slot that somebody in the room understands Chinese. Basically, the system is supposed to be the equivalent of a really, 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 really well-programmed chatbot. The instruction manual essentially tells the man how to run through a series of operations that a chatbot runs through when deciding how to respond to somebody putting words into a chat box. So the room, the Chinese room on this description would pass the Turing test. It would seem to be intelligent enough to understand sentences written in Chinese, if you're outside the room. John Searle objects that this system doesn't really understand Chinese. First of all, the man doesn't seem to know what the Chinese characters mean. He's just sort of following the instruction manual and second of all, if you want to say that the entire room as a whole, like all of the papers in the room and the, and the instruction manual plus the man, if that thing is supposed to be the thing that understands Chinese, John Searle just thinks it's nonsensical. You know, a system like that isn't something that can understand Chinese. For him, processing symbols isn't the same thing as understanding them. His deeper point, Searle's deeper point is the following syntactic operations or processing based on purely formal features of a symbolic system alone are not sufficient to account for semantics, that is to say, the meanings of those symbols. Just because you can produce convincing behavior doesn't necessarily mean that you have psychological understanding. Now, Andy Clark doesn't have a direct response to John Searle, he sort of waves away the problem by saying that the physical symbol system gets around this somewhat because the physical symbol system is connected to its environment and it has responses to the environment on the basis of its symbolic representations, which notably the Chinese room does not have. It's not like the Chinese room in the scenario changes in response to its environment. We haven't specified that one of the things that the man does in the room is go back and change the instructional code in response to words that it gets through the mail slot. Whereas you can imagine that an actual user of language would sometimes, in a sense, change its instructional code in response to what's happening in its environment. So perhaps the Chinese room isn't a perfect example of a language user. Maybe a language user needs to be physically instantiated. So. Is syntactic manipulation sufficient for semantics? Kind of a mixed answer here. On the one hand, not quite, 
because maybe connectivity with the environment is an important component of semantics that is not merely about syntactic manipulation. On the other hand, it's a small concession because the opinion would be that if you have a set of operations that are well defined enough and that respond to its environment in an appropriate way, then syntactic manipulation will be sufficient to account for every other feature that is semantic about the system. You might still have questions about that. So that's something we'll talk about. Is syntactic manipulation sufficient for semantics? Another specific problem that Clark brings up for the physical symbol systems hypothesis is that physical sim symbols systems don't seem to exhibit fluent everyday coping, which is to say, if they're put in a new scenario that they've never been in before, they struggle, right? Because a lot of the times these physical symbol systems as they're programmed, they're programmed for very specific tasks. And sometimes if you change up the task just enough, they, they struggle to adapt. And you might think that a fully intentional system that genuinely understands the meanings of its thoughts, as it were, wouldn't struggle in that way with a new environment. I mean, it might be caught unawares, it might not know the right thing to do, but it would continue to have, it would continue to have responses to its environment on the basis of things that it knew and understood. And the objection to the physical symbol system is that it doesn't seem to exhibit this fluent everyday coping. There might be some computational solutions to that problem, but it does seem as if, for example, something like a Chinese room or a chatbot, not a perfect, not a perfect instantiation of an actual intelligent mind. So this brings up a further question, which is the question, if implementation, if the way that you build the system matters, for whether or not we think the system is intelligent, whether or not we think the system understands language that it's using, whether it's really genuinely having thoughts, is that a problem for functionalism? Note that it's not just a problem for machine functionalism, because maybe the problem is that machine functionalism hasn't specified the right conditions for something to have intentionality, and maybe there's some other functional solution that's not machine functionalism. But if the implementation of the system, if how the system is structured genuinely matters for whether the system counts as having mental states, is that a problem for functionalism? Well, yes and no. On the one hand, no, because functionalism has many different variants and depending on what variant you have, you could get the level of analysis wrong. Maybe the problem is that we're being too abstract with how we're defining language and the functions need to be more specific if we're going to get a genuinely intelligent system. Maybe only specific types of functional instantiations are okay and intelligent. That's not necessarily a problem for functionalism as, just as a description of the mental. It's just saying that not every functional specification, like not every symbol system, will be a language user that understands language. Not every symbol system will be a thinking system. What it does make salient is that the initial dream of computational functionalism was that you could build a mind in almost any way as long as it exhibited intelligent enough behavior. And nowadays, there's a little bit more skepticism toward that hypothesis. So perhaps we're becoming more conservative or more, more chauvinistic with respect to what sorts of systems exhibit intelligence. This brings up a follow-up question, which is something that I brought up in our discussion the other day, which is that we might be going too far in the other direction, right? <laughs> so it might be the case that we need to specify the functions more delicately in order to get something that genuinely understands language. But it might also be the case that we're kind of overcomplicating matters. Maybe we're being too chauvinistic and too liberal at the same time. Because aren't there lots of dumb organisms that we think do exhibit intentionality, like they do have purposive behavior and they do have meanings for the behavior that they perform. You know, like think of the dog that can press buttons to use language or uh, Alex the parrot that could use hundreds of words in, in English to communicate with its handler. Or think about just, you know, uh, an even more basic organism bees have ways of representing where food is that they communicate to other bees by dancing. And like bees are pretty complicated organisms, but 
in some ways they're a lot simpler than your average artificially intelligent system. They're certainly simpler than, than this lady right here, uh, who took years and years and years of complicated programming development. But we think that bees do have, they can use meanings. But do we think that this understands when I, when I ask it, hey computer, what's the weather today? Currently, in Poughkeepsie, it's 48 degrees Fahrenheit with clear skies and sun. Today, you can expect partly sunny weather with a high of 49 degrees and a low of 30 degrees. By the way, any time is a good time for unwrapping presents. If you'd like some gift ideas, computer, try saying something stop. like. Um, see, it was doing really well. It seemed to understand my query, understand my query in the sense of it was doing the thing that I wanted it to do, but then it went on a, on a tangent that was kind of irrelevant to the matter at hand. A human person wouldn't have made that mistake. And you can imagine that if bees could use language, they probably wouldn't have made that mistake either. So whatever computers are, if they're intelligent and if they really understand language, it's in a really different way than we do. And there's lots of questions that I have about that. So one problem that we've come to finally to wrap up the lecture for today is modeling a human mind maybe will require being really specific and chauvinistic about which functions are important to model exactly our language use and our symbolic understanding if the symbolic hypothesis is right about the mind. But whether or not understanding the human mind will help us understand mentality as a whole is another question. Like maybe we've moved to a place where we understand how we would have to build artificially intelligent things in order to reproduce human intelligence, but is doing that actually moving further away from what it is to have a creature with mentality in the first place? And if we are going in the wrong direction over here, does that mean that it's computationalism as a whole that's the problem? Or does it mean something else? Does it just mean that computationalism is focused too much on a, a human computational description and it's ignored something that seems important to us about psychology beyond human psychology. So that's it. That's the question that I'll leave you with today. Thank you for joining us on this lecture about the language of thought and symbolic systems. See you next time. Bye.